I invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, we are truly redeemed by your amazing grace, not by the work of our own hands or bodies. And we thank you for that gift of forgiveness that is given to us. We pray that that spirit is alive in the words of my mouth and the thoughts and prayers of all of us here gathered uh, around your word in this holy place today. This is our prayer to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If you want to follow along with the words that I'm speaking today, you can do that. There's a yellow insert uh, some, with some rather darkish pictures on the back. You can pull that out if you want to reference those. Also, uh, that was a lovely anthem. And I hear in these words, especially that middle section about we are redeemed, uh, I, I hear those words being spoken by our, uh, our main character in our story today. So maybe you want to take both of those home today and kind of put those side by side. But just, just to review, this is week five of a six-week sermon series. We started January 6th, ending next week, and we started off the year with this sermon series called Refresh, New Beginnings. And we are looking each week at a particular story in Scripture of somebody who's been given a second chance. For each of them, there was a change in the way they thought about God, and that led to a change in the way they lived for God. And we hope that that same thing can, can happen in our lives, that we might be inspired by them to grow in the way we think about God, and that that helps us grow in the way we serve God and live for God. That's our prayer as we start a new year. We started, to recap, on January 6th with the wise men. They were changed by visiting baby Jesus. Then the next week we uh, looked at the prophet Jonah, swallowed by a big fish, obviously changed, like how would that not change you, being in the belly of a fish for three days. Then two weeks ago uh, we looked at the very successful businesswoman, Lydia, who dealt in purple clothing. And then last week, Pastor Tina preached on a man paralyzed who was healed by Jesus when four friends uh, brought him to Jesus. And today, I would like to begin with a disclaimer, and that is, normally, uh, when I read Scripture, I would encourage you to do the same thing. We want to be open-minded. We want to have an open mind and heart to try to be as objective as possible we don't want our prejudices and biases to get in the way of that word that God might be speaking to us. Well, today it's hard for me because I am biased. <laughs> I really, really like the main character in our story today. He's there, right there on your yellow insert, the pictures. I mean, he, he, he's, not, he's symbolically referenced by Wreck-It Ralph. Um, I don't know how many of you are beyond the age of watching children's movies. I'm not. I'm still very much in that, that milieu. But even if you're too old, quote unquote, too old to watch children's movies, you ought to think about it because there's great lessons for all adults in them. And Wreck-It Ralph uh, was an animated movie that came out in 2012 that has such a message. It's a story about a video game and video game characters. One of the characters is Wreck-It Ralph, and the other primary character is Fix-It Felix. And in the game, the video game that players play, Ralph's job is to break things, and the game operator works with Fix-It Felix to fix what Ralph has broken. Make sense? So the obvious hero in the game is... Fix it, Felix. The obvious villain in the game is Ralph, wreck it, Ralph. And so the movie begins with the lights going down on the arcade, and when that happens and the day is over, the characters all go to their respective homes, and Fix it, Felix marches up to the top of his high rise with all of his friends, and they dine sumptuously and have great fellowship and camaraderie and community uh, on, on the top of the high rise apartment building, and wreck it, Ralph is sent to the junkyard, <laughs> and he sleeps on a pile of broken bricks. And here is where we start to commiserate or sympathize with poor Ralph, because all he wants is to be part of the community. All he wants is to be accepted, right, and to, and to, and to be accepted for, who he, for whom he, who he is. But instead, he's banished 
and rejected and kicked out. Somebody's frowning. That's the appropriate response, right? We're sad about that. But that's the way that the movie Wreck-It Ralph begins. And it only begins, though, to touch on the, the nuances of our Scripture story today. Our Scripture comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. It's a long story. It's a good story, though. And I'd like to recite it for us this morning. And the context for this story is that Jesus and his disciples have just sailed across the Sea of Galilee in a boat, and when they get to the other side, this is what happened next. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And immediately, as Jesus was getting out of the boat, a man from among the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs, and no one had the strength to restrain him. For he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart, the shackles he smashed into pieces, no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountain, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus from a great distance, he ran and bowed down before him and said, Jesus, Son of the Most High God, I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of that man, you unclean spirit. And then Jesus asked him, what is your name? The man said, My name is Legion, for, for we are many demons. And the demons earnestly begged him not to send them out of the country. Well, there on the hillside, a great herd of swine was feeding, and the unclean spirits begged Jesus, Send us into the swine, let us enter them. And Jesus gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out of the man and into the swine and the whole herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. Well, the swine herds ran off to tell it in the city and in the country, and people came to see what had taken place. They came and found Jesus and they saw the demoniac sitting there, fully clothed, and in his right mind, the very man who had the legion in him. They were afraid. And then those who had seen what had happened to the swine and to the demoniac reported it. And then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. And as Jesus was getting into the boat... The man who had been possessed by demons, he begged that he might go with Jesus. But Jesus refused and said, no, go home and tell your friends how much the Lord has done for you and what great mercy he has shown you. And the man went out and proclaimed in the Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. The Word of God for the people of God. Jesus meets a man, and the first way that he's described to us is having an unclean spirit. Right? Unclean spirits. He's possessed, he's full of demons. We might use more nuanced language today. We might talk of mental illness. And if that's the case, then I think about the people that I've encountered and walked alongside for part of their journey in my 20-year career as a, ministry, as a minister. People that I have met who have battled demons of things like paranoid schizophrenia, 
People who have heard voices over and over and over again. Voices that don't let them go. And people who, because of those voices, will try anything. Alcohol, chain smoking, harder drugs. Something to make the stress and anxiety of those voices lessen, even for just a moment. I think about people that I've met in my ministry career who, career who, because of the demons they face, have hurt themselves. Cutting, biting, scratching pulling their own hair because for some reason this superficial pain that they're in control of can mask even for a moment the much deeper darkness that lies within. Is that what's happening to this man? Scripture says that he's bruising himself with stones as though he's grabbing it, whatever he can and trying to get those demons out. But he can't. And I think about the people that I've met in my career who have battled these kinds of demons, how they have families who, while they may get frustrated with the behavior of the one battling those demons, they don't give up on them. They don't. But this man, he can't say that. You see, his community has kicked him out. Because where does Jesus meet him? Not in the town square among the tombs. He's living in the cemetery. He's living in the graveyard. And oh, by the way, the graveyard, the cemetery, back then, not like what we think of now. Not with a nice stone arch and a beautiful sign that reads something, something gardens. Didn't have manicured lawns and nice benches and shade trees. Cemeteries weren't places where you would go after Sunday worship on Memorial Day and and lay flowers at the tombstones of your loved ones. I wish it were the case. That's a much nicer way to think of, of life and death now. But back then, the cemeteries were outside of town, far away from where people lived, because the dead were to be separated from the living. And the only reason you visited the cemetery, because it was your turn to go. And so, you see, this man being sent to live among the tombs is the community's way of saying, we're done with you. We are writing you off. We don't want to look at you. We don't want to think about you. You are dead to us. And that's not all, because once he's in the, in the tombs, among the tombs, he's, he's described as an animal. He's described in animalistic ways. He's, quote, chained up in shackles. That's not how we treat human beings. That's how we treat livestock, chattel, animals. He's half clothed or half naked. We know that because at the end of the story, he's fully clothed. Animals don't need clothing. And and he's not using language. At least that's the way he's described. He's, quote, howling. That's what animals do. The literal word in the the Greek language of the New Testament is screeching like a raven. That's not pleasant. He's not even given the courtesy of being able to verbalize as humans do. Oh, and since he's acting like an animal and he's treated therefore like an animal, he might as well live among animals because right next to the graveyard are a bunch of pigs, 2,000 of them, And the pigs for the Jews were the lowest of the animals, the most unkosher of the creatures of the earth. That's befitting a guy like this, right? Oh, and we're still not done because he he doesn't have a name. Oh, he calls himself to Jesus. My name is Legion, but that's really just a symbolic reference to the fact that he has 2,000 demons in him because a legion of soldiers was 2,000. So he's referring to himself as a nickname, a number. But that's not how the people call, describe him. The people use the derogatory nickname of demoniac, which means the demon possessed. They don't even call him a man. It's like he's a thing, an object, the demon possessed. You know, Scripture says that we are created in the image of God. In the image of God, God created man and woman. In the image of God, he created them male and female. Genesis 1. 
But it's as though this image of God has even been taken out of him. He's an object. He's not even worth the image of God. So let's just all close our eyes to him. Much worse than Wreck-It Ralph. <laughs> but I think about how many, how many times we may do this, willingly or, or more likely unwillingly in our lives and in our comings and goings. How many times we might write people off because of their behavior or we pass judgment on somebody by, by the sounds that they make or their eccentric behavior, what we call eccentric and we do that without considering the fact that they might be battling demons of their own. Well, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus, his whole community cast this man out to the graveyard. But Jesus sails right there. He sails across the, 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 the sea, and the Scripture says immediately as they got to shore, he, he was among the tombs. See, in other words, there was a whole coastline that Jesus could have steered the boat, but he went out of his way to go right to this man where he was. Jesus didn't give up on him. He sought him out, actively went to him and reached out to him. And the man recognized Jesus. That may be the best part. The community tried to take the image of God out of him, but the image of God was there, and the image of God in him recognized the Christ in front of him. Because Scripture says when he was still far off, the man ran to Jesus. And remember, in the Bible, people don't run for exercise. I do, right? People run in the Bible because they're excited. So he's excited to get to Jesus, and he bows down before him in a, in a gesture of worship, and he confesses him. Jesus, Son of the Most High God. Who are we to judge? Who are we to judge someone's ability to confess faith in Jesus? Well, Jesus responds by, of course, bringing the demons out of the man, placing them into the pigs, the swine go into the sea and they drowned. Right? That's a huge deal for some. <laughs> the, the swine herders are like, wait, wait, what, what, what? <laughs> what happened? I, 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 they were here one minute, now they're gone. And so they run off to the city hall to lodge a formal complaint. Hey, my pigs just died. Some stranger sailed in across the sea. Now my livestock are dead. And now the whole city comes out. Now they come out to the cemetery. The whole community comes out to see what's going on. And here's where the begging begins. Because the people beg Jesus to leave. Why would they do that? Are they afraid he's going to kill their animals too? Maybe. Did they hate this man with the demons so much that they couldn't stand him getting a little bit of grace, a little bit of amazing grace? The Germans have a word for this, schadenfreude. That's rejoicing in the suffering of others. <laughs> Is that what they were doing? They were rejoicing in this poor man's suffering, and when they couldn't do that anymore, when Jesus took that away, they turned on Jesus. I, I don't know. But I do know that by begging Jesus to leave, they were showing that they did not understand. They did not recognize him. They did not recognize the impact that he would have on them and upon the world, on others. And they stand in contrast to the man who did have the demons because he also begs. But what does he beg to do? Go with Jesus. Please, Jesus, take me with you. And that makes perfect sense. Number one, his community already disowned him. Why do I want to go back there? Plus, Jesus saved his life. Jesus saw past all of that, the behavior that everybody else said was strange Jesus saw past the surface to the man who was inside of him, to the human being that exists, and he brought that out. At the end of the story, this man is fully clothed and in his right mind. He's a human being again. Of course, he always was, but he's restored to his full dignity. Only Jesus did that. Imagine this man's devotion to Jesus. He would have run through a brick wall for Jesus. And besides, he's got the perfect testimony 
Anytime Jesus preaches, he can say, I'm, I'm living proof of the second chance that, that this man can give you. We expect, therefore, Jesus to say, yes, come along. You can be my right-hand man, and together we're going to go out there and, and do great things. But instead, what does Jesus say? No. Sometimes God says no. And in this case, I believe it has something to do with this. The community needed the gospel, and Jesus needed the man to bring that gospel to them. He needed the community, and they needed the gospel. And so he needed to stay. He needed to stay. Even though those people were begging Jesus to leave, and even though he did leave, he did not give up on them. No more than he gave, wasn't willing to give up on the man with the demons. Because in the community that Jesus is building, in the high-rise apartment that Jesus is building, everyone deserves a second chance. Fix it, Felix. Wreck it, Ralph. The demoniac... And the people that send him to the cemetery, you deserve one, I deserve one. And you and I deserve one, and so do the people who walk our streets and our neighborhoods and communities that we may drive past, who may be battling their own demons, looking for somebody to extend to them a word of hope. Sometimes we think, and this was the attempt with the empty box, I don't think this children's message was very good. Right? But my intent with that was to do this. Sometimes we think <laughs> that if only something about my life were different, I'd be better able to serve God. Like if only I were smarter, or if only I were uh, taller, or if only I were older, if only I were younger, if only I were more eloquent, if only I lived in a different place, if only I had different resources, if only this or that, then I would serve God better. But it's th that's what the man thought. If only I leave this place and follow you, Jesus, I'll be able to serve you. But as we learn, we have enough. The box can be empty. And we can still, with who we are, where we are, how we are, serve God. Because how does this beautiful story end? It ends with the man staying home and telling his story and, quote, Everyone was amazed. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for this day, for this word, for this hope that we have in you. In your name we pray. Amen.